to um, Patrick Dan and I are going to um, divide the time in this last lecture and offer some remarks about the future of social science genomics. First, just some logistics. Um, so you will have lost access to Ad Health already. Sam already mentioned the um, the bus um, for the airport tomorrow. Um, you'll be getting instructions. I think you have gotten already instructions for how to get expenses reimbursed. You'll also get a request to fill out a um, feedback form that goes directly to the RSF. So please take the time to do that. We value your feedback. Um, please let also let others know about the camp. In fact, I think we we will. Um, and add you to our monthly mailing list unless you ask not to be included. And um, um, so through that mailing list, you'll learn about job opportunities in this area that occasionally co crop up and also future camps and relevant conferences. So we hope to stay in touch. OK, and then so now on to the future of science, social science genomics. It starts tonight at 6.40 <laughs> in the lobby. OK, so see you there. Um, all right, so let me just reiterate some of the themes that we've discussed. Um, so the first has to do with uh, interpreting genetic effects. We, we've like, explicitly cast the way we think about these um, parameters in a causal framework where, a, where um, a genetic effect is a result of a hypothetical change in genotype at conception. Um, and when you think about it, and then we define the additive effect as, as an average of these effects across different environments. Um, and by definition, this average is going to pick up potentially um, um, interactions with other genes and interactions with the environmental factors to the extent that they um, operate. Um, we also, and you know, once, once you think about it this way, it becomes pretty clear. We think that sometimes genes can, genetic effects can operate through the environment, and that's, a, um, that's an important um, point that keeps coming up, especially in these studies of behavioral phenotypes. Right? There's nobody that thinks that there's some biological process through which a um, an allele could impact your income in, in virtually any realistic case you can think of is going to be through some um, um, more complex pathway that involves a lot of things that go on outside the, the body. Um, okay, and then we made this distinction between the endogenous environments, so genetic effects that influence your outcome through an environment, and the exogenous environment, um, which refers to features of your environment that vary independently of your specific genetic draw that you got. We talked about heritability, um, and we, uh, we discussed two ways, two reasons not to care about heritability. So the first we call the Jenks critique. It doesn't, high heritability doesn't necessarily mean that environmental factors are important, and you can imagine a trait that has a heritability of zero, and yet we have no, you know, we have no known way of uh, modifying it. it, it re there really, really is no obvious relationship between modifiability and this, and this parameter. Um, we emphasize that heritability is not an index of policy effectiveness. So even setting aside the Jenks critique, there's this issue that in a particular, like the parameter estimate, the heritability estimate is always going to be a feature of a population some period of time. And it tells you whether the uh, range of environments in that population, exogenous environments in that population currently explain a lot of um, variance. And it could be that you know, the range of exogenous environments exp explain very little variance. So maybe in only two people have eyeglasses, to use Goldberger's famous uh, analogy. Um, in, in such a world, you know, eyeglasses would explain practically 0% of the variance in, um, uh, in eyesight. And it could still be that giving people eyeglasses um, comfortably passes any sort of reasonable cost-benefit test. Um, and then we emphasize the difference between the true process by which the data are generated and the model that you assume. And when there's a mismatch between the two, you're typically going to get bias, and that was a you work through a simple example in one of the problem sets um, that was intended to sort of convey this idea that if, you, uh, if, if we live in a world where the ACE assumptions aren't satisfied, probably your, a twin study estimate of narrow heritability is actually going to um, be, reflect some mix of, of uh, additive and other uh, variance component estimates. Okay. Um, Okay, so there are reasons not to care about heritability, but there are also reasons to care about it. And the, maybe the main one uh, right now is that it tells us um, it tells us how much predictive power we could get out of a polygenic score. In principle, if we observed all um, genetic um, variants and if we knew their effects. Okay, um, okay. environment. So we've thought of environment as a treatment effect again from a hypothetical change, some kind of intervention, um, and. Once you think about it this way, um, the, um, um, I think 
uh, I, I think it, it helps sort of interpret a lot of um, results that are out there in the literature. So conceptually, we think of a G by E effect as one in which you, like the ideal experiment would randomly assign genotype and some in treatment. And then we say that there's a G by E effect if the effect of the treatment really depends, acro varies across genotypes. And in naturally occurring data, in observational data that most of us work with, there come a number of like, interpretational issues that arise when we don't, because we can't run that experiment. Um, one of them is that your environment might, might be caused by G. And another one is that your genes are correlated. So maybe what you're picking up is really an interaction with some other genes that you didn't control for. None of this is to say, when we talk about these ideal experiments, like one thing I should make clear, it's not to make the perfect the enemy of the good. It's just to get a kind of baseline scenario that helps us to think clearly about what kind of biases and problems emerge in any practical you know, application. And so once we have the ideal scenario, then I think it often helps, helps us think more clearly about you know, what are the ways in which we deviate from the ideal scenario and what can we do to maybe quantify um, how much that matters. Okay, so we've emphasized additive genetic effects. Um, in part, that's because, because of the way that they're defined, they're sometimes going to capture um, a substantial share of variance. Um, and we've emphasized interpretation of this additive genetic factor as a BLP, the best linear predictor. Um, okay, this we already said. We talked about different ways of estimating this BLP, this additive genetic factor. You can estimate, you can define it both for some subset of SNPs that you've measured or imputed, and you could, you could, um, you could define it for, for all of the SNPs, including those that are unmeasured. And in, in practice, um, any difference between the proportion uh, of variance um, between the two is, really the, is, 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 is uh, analogous to the difference between what we call SNP heritability and, um, and a twin-based estimate of heritability, or twin family-based behavior genetic estimate of heritability. Okay. So then um, we're living in interesting times. There are lots of opportunities here um, uh, because we're starting to actually be able to measure um, uh, DNA directly, variation across people um, directly at the molecular level. Um, we talked a lot about these early candidate gene studies and some of the problems that they faced and that we still face. Um, and first is population stratification, probably the single greatest confound and maybe one of the key messages to get, a, get across here is that in virtually any realist, like, to, to, like virtually always, it's insufficient to, to control for a person's self-reported race. It's very hard to think of a scenario where this wouldn't be true. And it's, again, I want to emphasize, this is not some, um, this actually practically matters uh, a lot uh, in most cases. And the example that comes to mind was, uh, Dan had a nice slide in, um, where he showed what, just, what, what happens if you take a variant that's, um, with an allele frequency that varies um, ac across Europe. Um, and if you just control for self-reported race in a certain sample, I think the result was that the variant is associated with like half a year more of schooling, something like that. Okay? But then if you progressively define more uh, genetically homogeneous estimation samples and control for PCs, the, the, this association goes away. Um, and you know, if you do a GWAS without a genetically homogeneous sample and with, without being you know, taking care to ensure that you're doing the best you can controlling for PCs and other compounds, or variables that capture potential compounds, you will get uh, nonsense. And a lot of, actually, a lot of early, um, um, like in the early days of GWAS, when people were still figuring out um, mm, uh, you know, what, what methods work in practice, you know, one common problem when people, um, when, when there were, um, claims that subsequently turned out not to be correct. A common source of, pro of our errors was just uh, quality, poor quality control. Um, and a second source of errors was just poor control for um, omitted factors. Um, and maybe I should add here, we're just kind of entering a phase. For a long time, there was this feeling that PCs did, <laughs> mag like were, were, um, um, did surprisingly well in just ruling out omitted variables. And again, I think for a lot of social science applications, that's, you shouldn't think of them as some magic cure. You should think of something, so of them as something that mitigates a problem. We do the best we, we can, but there's absolutely no reason to think that the final um, estimates we get are completely purged of any you know, omitted variable bias. Um, and in fact, we have, we've seen plenty of evidence to the contrary. There's this issue of multiple hypothesis testing that arises in genetic research. There are many variants we could test. There are many potential ways to split the sample. There are, there's an almost uh, like there's a 
the number of interactions um, you could test in principle between these genes is just um, um, a number that's very hard to imagine because it's so big. The combinatorics are just staggering. Um, you could potentially test for a lot of G by E effects. And we think that in a lot of the early candidate gene studies, um, there were a lot of kind of investigative degrees of freedom in choosing these things that kind of led to a um, selected subset of the analyses run being reported in final papers, often results having gone through a statistical significance filter. Um, okay, and there are many ways to specify test for association. Um, and the other source of error, um, or, 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 um, or um, low repl rep replicability in the early studies was that they, were, they had low power. So we've emphasized that results, um, positive results that come from well-powered analyses, all else equal or more credible. Uh, and that's just a lot, like, that just follows logically from, from Bayes' rule. Um, we now know quite definitively from GWAS um, that common variants rarely, you know, virtually always have small effects on, on behavioral phenotypes. So we have a much better sense of what the plausible effect size is on average um, than we did um, just five years ago, say. Um, and in fact, this four, and, 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 uh, and James Lee and some of us have a paper um, that cheaply refers to this as the fourth law of behavior genetics. So it's, it's, uh, it's in, intended to supplement uh, Turkheimer's three laws, which were about um, um, sort of stylized facts from behavior genetic studies. Um, we've emphasized that when a study has low power, whether or not the results are significant, um, the results are just not very informative. Intuitively, the reason is if your study um, if your study has low power to detect a statistically significant effect, um, then that means that you know, in one state of the world, the SNP is null, so simplifying a little bit, and then you know, at 5% significance threshold, you should in principle, if there are no investigative degrees of freedom, 5% of the time you should reject the null. But if your power is only 7%, then 7% you know, of the time um, you'll reject the null um, when, um, when it's false, um, and the fact that you reject the null approximately <laughs> the same um, uh, fraction of the time means that you, should, you, shouldn't just, you shouldn't update your beliefs very strongly just from observing a statistically significant result. Um, okay, and the second problem with low power is that even if, um, um, even if you're right that there is an association, you have to be very careful in interpreting estimates from studies with low power because conditional on finding a statistically significant effect a study with low power is going to report an over, a substantial overestimate of the true effect size. And this comes up especially uh, when you do um, power analyses. Um, so if you do a power analysis um, and you want, you want to know some parameter and you go out and you find similar studies that try to estimate it, um, if the results in the liter literature went through a statistical significance threshold and if the studies were low powered, then what you're going to get is a, is a kind of selected um, uh, set of estimates that overestimate the true um, effect. Um, and so you don't want to use that exaggerated effect size to do your um, power calculation. And if you do, you're going to overstate your actual power. And all of these things, to some extent, all these problems, to some extent, come up also in, in GWAS. Um, but I think there's a compelling argument that, um, in many cases, uh, GWAS helps address the problem and was sort of designed to address some of the problems. OK. Um, so something about the new uh, social science genomics. It's useful to kind of reflect on what happened because as little as five, ten years ago, we, all, we knew almost nothing about genes associated with behavioral traits, um, at least not common variants. Um, and I, mean, I think the fundamental force at work here was that data just became a lot, more, uh, che a lot cheaper and more widely available. Um, and if you, talk to, um, if you talk to people who have studied things like the replication crisis in in psychology, many of them will point to genetics as an area that went from um, uh, a, um, having a research infrastructure that tended to produce very unreliable findings. Of course, there are notable exceptions. But for the sort of outcomes we've discussed, uh, in the po uh, overwhelmingly focused on in the past two weeks, I think it's fair to say that um, um, virtually all previous like, claims of genetic association should be viewed very skeptically. Um, and there's been a massive transformation um, to these larger, better powered studies. And what fundamentally drove that transformation was that the data became available and we, we were, and, and, and also an appreciation, I think, of, of the statistical problems. But with just an appreciation of the statistical problems, without the data, we would still have been very limited in what we could do. Um, so we can do these large scale GWAS. Um, there's been an explosion in the number of identified loci. There's every reason to think it will continue. 
um, we can construct increasingly predictive polygenic scores, and we're beginning to see applications in the social sciences. I mean, it really is an incredible thing. If you go back just two years um, to the previous workshop, or three years to the first RSF workshop, there's been dramatic progress. I mean, it, on, on a scale that I think is quite rare in, in, um, you know, in most uh, scientific fields. <laughs> Uh, most of us work and most researchers work in fields where this kind of steady accumulation of knowledge and fast, uh, an accumulation of knowledge that's very fast paced is, is unheard of. Um, so, you know, we've gone from have knowing, having no, no credible evidence of any genetic associations with educational attainments, for example, to having over a thousand genome-wide significant um, hits for which the evidence is very credible. Okay. Um, so I want to say something about like, emerging applications. Um, um, and this is, so the sort of stuff you could do with, um, uh, with this new knowledge, because it is important to, that we try to put it to productive use. Um, so the first is, is you can start to study um, gene by environment interactions. And personally, I would, like, I would like that very much, because I'm really tired of telling everybody that Patrick and Sylvia's paper is the best GBA paper ever written. And the way to, um, the way to um, um, get me to stop saying that is to write an even better paper. So hopefully one of you guys will do that. Um, we've emphasized a lot of the applications. In a lot of the applications, the um, um, involve polygenic scores. Um, because it's not always obvious what they're capturing, because it's actually a lot more subtle than people might assume at first, um, on first thought, We've emphasized that you know, the most uncontroversial applications are going to be in, um, as controls, in randomized controlled trials in these sorts of settings. So you can use them to control, just to shrink the standard errors. You can use them to test for balance between treatment and control group. Um, and you can also use them to study potential mediation effects. So of course, once you have a polygenic score that predicts some outcome, the natural question is, you know, to what pathways and does the predictive power change across different environments in interesting ways? We've emphasized that you can use um, publicly available summary statistics to do things like estimate SNP heritabilities and look at the genetic correlation between traits. Um, we've talked about um, a new, like, like a new uh, set of findings that, as best I can recall, were, uh, were not, at least not universally like, um, um, known as two years ago. So, so we've talked about the new evidence that for a lot of traits, G by E correlation is, a, uh, is an important feature of the data. Um, and, and that matters for all kinds of reasons. It matters, for example, for as I kept emphasizing, it matters for the interpretation of the polygenic scores. It also matters for sort of um, rec um, getting to the bottom of some debates um, that took place back in the 70s. When you remember, in my, on the very first day of class, we looked at these phenotypic resemblance between different pairings of relatives and how they decayed. And there was this enormous debate about what model best explains the decay, and one source of disagreement. And the fundamental problem was we only had seven or eight moments, but we had, in principle, like a realistic model might have 12, 13 parameters. So people that made different assumptions about some of the parameters and reached different conclusions about what explained the pattern of decay. And some people placed a lot of emphasis on G by E correlation, and others did not. And with the molecular data, we can now revisit this debate. And I think this, uh, the evidence is quite, um, you know, almost conclusive that the G by E correlation is a uh, is an important um, 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 feature of the data, at least for outcomes such as education. Um, we, st we started thinking about you know, using genetic data to study sibling interactions. Um, when we talked about adoption studies, we similarly talked about using genetic data to kind of um, better understand what are the features of the parental, of the household environment and your parental um, and your household parents that predict children's outcomes, even conditional on, on polygenic scores. We talked about Mendelian randomization, how gen genetics could potentially be used to um, strengthen causal inference. Um, we talked about the sort of mating. And one, one topic that we didn't really touch upon, partly because it's not an area of, ex of expertise of ours, is that you can use these genetic data also to study you know, evolutionary history, trace out historical population movements, and these sorts of things. So there are all these applications and it really is remarkable if you just go back as little as five years, most of these, were, you know, most of these applications were just things that we, we would point to as you know, things that may be possible in the future. Um, and now increasingly these applications are realistic. We have the data to actually do, do them, pursue them in a, in a, um, in a uh, serious way. 
Okay. Um, we've tried to we've tried to um, discuss um, you know, good research practices. Um, we emphasize the fact that a lot of the when we enter this field, a lot of the findings that were being reported have were, were not credible, and I think um, subsequent literature has sort of borne that out. Um, as a result of this, as a result of the practices that were being widely used, there were a lot of claims being made that weren't backed up by the evidence and didn't really result in any lasting accumulation of, of, of knowledge. And there's this unfortunate tendency to kind of do, um, to, um, to, um, to try to, to try to publish, uh, you know, say, findings that we look to superficially correct and, you know, were statistically significant at some nominal level. And maybe that's a, maybe, maybe, um, maybe that way, maybe that's a good strategy if the goal is to publish papers, given the standards that journals adopted at the time. But it's not a good strategy if the, if the goal was sort of increasing scientific um, understanding. And I think that the, there's been a sort of a, um, uh, that the methodological rigor of the, of the field as a whole has, uh, has increased uh, substantially. Um, that's not to say that we're immune from running into these problems in the future, and maybe, maybe that's something we can discuss later. So standards are rising in the empirical work. Um, one reason for the rising standards is I think there's a, wide, like there's a growing appreciation for the fourth law and what the kind of realistic effect size is. Um, those can be used to, 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 to for more plausible ex-ante power calculations. I think there's also wider awareness of the role that multiple hypotheses, problems, and publication bias um, played in um, 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 in producing the the the, the like the, the the this proliferation of of um, candidate gene associations that were being reported until quite recently. Okay, and we talked about how you can use. Um, um, Bayesian reasoning to assess the credibility of, uh, of findings in some cases. Okay, sometimes pre-registration might also be a good idea. I um, don't want to talk too much about this. Okay, so so far what I talked about was sort of um, um, issues that apply to the rigor of the science, the credibility of the fi findings, but as we've um, tried to repeatedly emphasize, and this is an issue that's come up in conversation a number of times, science isn't done in a vacuum, so we've also had a number of productive conversations about taking ethical responsibility um, and um, Michelle's lecture was intended to not to uh, hold anybody responsible for what people were doing a hundred years ago that would be absurd but to remind us all that um, that um, history matters um, and that if we have some awareness of history then like the, the, and that we you know, history matters if we understand it, we can probably do things to minimize the risks of, or at least reduce the risks that historical mistakes are repeated. And we have a sort of collective responsibility in light of this history to, to um, proceed carefully um, and responsibly. Um, there are other ethical issues that didn't come up as much. So one has to do with the sensitivity of genetic data. And that was for a very long time a constraint um, when you worked with these sort of, um, in, this, um, in this field. Um, so, so like one uh, another aspect of you know, of uh, of another dimension of, of pursuing uh, this work in ethical ways is obviously to make sure that you're uh, um, not sharing in d data in any way that risks um, um, revealing pri you know, confidential information about um, people who contributed to your study. In our case, in our settings, the main way in which this comes up is that there are restrictions on the sort of summary statistics that you can post online, um, but it turns out that in practice you can work around those restrictions with uh, um, th there, are, there are ways to sort of safeguard privacy while at the same time being quite, um, um, you know, sharing a lot of summary statistics. The, 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 main, the main thing you have to wear, be wary of is sort of not, pr not providing allele frequencies to like fourth decimal place of accuracy or something like that. Okay, obviously you should only do research if, if, if you have the you know, appropriate IRB um, um, approvals and these sorts of things, because without saying. And finally, um, to reiterate something that came up in the discussion just before this lecture, uh, we, think it's, we think it's a good idea to avoid hype and, and, and sort of headline grabbing results and be very transparent about limitations and interpretational caveats. Um, sometimes you know, for a high profile paper, you might even want to pursue this proactively and sort of make sure to um, 
write something that explains in sort of plain language what, um, what should and shouldn't be inferred from your findings. Okay, so are you going to continue now? So Patrick's going to talk about the next five years now. Great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about kind of what's what's coming, what's what's uh, what's next. Um, and so uh, you know, the first thing I want to talk about is you know, one one of the big reasons that we've seen an explosion in in social science genetics research is all of a sudden there's all these uh, a lot of data that's available. And so here's just a list of of some of the studies um, that are, are available now at, at you know reasonably large sample sizes. You probably recognize most of these. Ad Health is the one that. Um, we've been really lucky to have access to during, during this course this week. Health and Retirement Study is an older sample. UK Biobank is the one out of the, um, you know, it's, it's probably one of the largest that's available. But, but I, th I believe that all of these are just generally available to researchers if, um, on application. And so this might be a good place to start if you're thinking about um, projects you want to undertake and what data there might be. Th this, this link here is, is the link to the participating cohorts to the SSGAC studies. And so, you know, there, I think there's like 70 something studies in the, in the most, like oh, there's like 100 these days? There's like 100 studies. Um, and so some of these have, have varying, um, you know, getting access to them is, it may be more or less difficult, but that might also be a place to look and you can, if, uh, if you want to talk to us about, you know, who our contact is or things like that, we're happy to help you navigate uh, some of those things. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of data. Um, and, and because we have all this data, we're at a stage where, you know, we're just lots and lots of discovery. We have huge sample sizes, we're identifying SNPs in our GWAS. Um, using these results, we're getting a better understanding of the biological and behavioral mechanisms at all. There's still, of course, plenty of room, which is what we're going to be doing for the next five years. Um, there's methods being developed, and so things like LD score regression and MR agar regression, and these, these are things that um, are, have, have been developed incredibly recently and they're, and they're major tools that make up um, a, a huge portion of, of our toolkit as social, social science geneticists and, and I anticipate that um, we'll th these methods will, will keep on getting developed and, and maybe even by, well hopefully, by, by people who are here today, um, oh, we'll develop new methods. Um, and, and so in the past we were kind of constrained because getting enough data to, to, um, to use these methods was, was very, very difficult. And so there was a whole string of methods being developed that were based on just summary statistics. However, you know, as we're getting, you know, with the UK Biobank and Estonia coming online and, and um, you know, other, other data sets that are, that, are, that are showing up, I think we're going to start seeing methods that take advantage of, of newly, available, newly available individual level data. And so I, th I think that'll, that'll be really exciting um, and, and will uh, open the doors to lots of other sorts of interesting questions. Um, we talked a lot about polygenic scores this week. I mean, for, th for the moment, I think the bulk of, of the work that many of us is going to do is going to be based on polygenic scores. Um, and so here, this is the plot we saw earlier this week about the predictive power of the polygenic score as a function of its heritability and, and the sample size used in discovery. And so, you know, we're living, this is in millions and the, and the uh, x-axis, by the way. And so kind of we're living in this, this region here for, for some of our traits, but as, as, as our samples get larger, we're going to have more and more predictive polygenic scores, which will be really useful for other kinds of questions that we may be interested in. Um, we're also getting more phenotypes. You know, before we would have to like get hodgepodges of small data sets that happen to have the phenotype that we want. But with things like the health and retirement study, or Ad Health, or Wisconsin, you know, th um, someone mentioned fragile families. Like we have these longitudinal data sets which are richly phenotyped. Um, and so, uh, oh, so yeah, so these are some of the phenotypes we need to get big data sets. But but there's lots of things that we should be interested in in, in looking at. But there's lots of things that I think all of us are interested in, in looking at. Um, something to keep in mind, you know, as, as the kind of up and coming researchers in this field, um, we have a say in the type of data that are collected. And so we should encourage um, these data sets that are, that are, you know, producing data and, and just starting to, to um, build these studies to include the phenotypes that, that we think are important and that we're interested in. Um, so let's talk about kind of the research that, that makes sense to do. So I'm not going to tell you what to study, but, but hopefully mostly just 
um, go over again the, the important questions that we should ask as we're, as we're designing our studies. And this will be largely a review of, of what we said dozens of times. Um, so first and foremost, are we well powered? Remember your tote bag. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so before you embark on any study, think about plausible effect sizes, think about how big your sample size can get, and, and start thinking about if, if, if you're going to be well powered enough to get there. Um, think about multiple hypothesis testing. You know, so if, if you don't really have an idea in your head of what the design's going to be and you want to try a bunch, you know, and, 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 and maybe you need to try a bunch of things, make, think about what that's going to do in terms of taking that into a taking that into account as you design, design your studies. And then if you've had to you know, check multiple phenotypes or specifications or there are a variety of tests in your papers, um, think, think about this as well. Are, are, are the you know, 0 0.05 significant findings um, arising perhaps just by chance or, or can, can, you, can you be more confident um, in them after you do this kind of correction? Population stratification, again, have you, have you thought about the, the how population stratification may affect the results um, of your study? It, it will affect the results of your study, so be careful in how you caveat the, the, the results and, and how sensitive the results will be, um, depending on the design decisions that you make. Um, you know, winner's curse, we talked about when you're doing the power calculations from up here, um, you know, you should take things like winner's curse into account because those, those results will often be inflated and so we want to be responsible in, in planning these studies that way. Uh, we've talked a bunch about um, how do we interpret genetic effects. So if we want to design a study and, and we think, oh, well, this is, because, you know, you start with a question, um, is, is to, to what degree does using the genetic data um, answer that question and what are the limitations on how far you can interpret um, the, uh, the results that you have. Um, if you're doing G by E, think about, you know, is, is E exogenous? And if it isn't, uh, how does that affect, affect your design? You know, um, keep in mind what the, the ideal experiment is and then uh, how we should think about it if, if we don't have this exogenous um, variation in E. Or if we're doing Mendelian randomization, think hard about the exclusion restriction or maybe the inside assumption if you're doing something like Egger. You know, so, so ideally we would want to meet, meet we should always think about the, the assumptions that, that are there and then make, make sure we're very clear as we um, present our research um, in our papers and to the public, um, you know, how far we can take the interpretation of, of those results as well. Um, so, you know, I talked about PGSs briefly versus specific variants. So we, so we know, given the fourth law, these SNPs have teeny tiny effect sizes, and that's why we may think, um, well, instead of, uh, instead of using just one, let's, let's use a whole polygenic score. But um, the trade-off, though, is that if we're using a polygenic score, we don't really know exactly what it means. And we can do follow-up research, and we should. We should do follow-up research to try to um, understand as best we can um, what they mean. But, um, but there's, there's a trade-off between, between the power versus the interpretability. Um, but even though it's not very interpretable, right, like I don't think we should throw them out. They can be useful um, in a lot of ways. Um, if you need to know the mechanism, then, uh, then you should use variants that, that have a well-known mechanism. So, so for example, if you're doing a, a, structural, a structural model and you want to say, oh, I'm going to have the SNP represent some, some aspect of the, of the agents in my model, um, you know, you shouldn't just toss those in um, unless, unless you understand what it is. Um, in Mendelian randomization as well, because of the exclusion restriction, if we don't understand what the SNP is doing, um, it's hard to justify or it's hard to explain um, what exactly we're, we're uh, observing when we do a Mendelian randomization study. Um, same, with, same with G by E. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, I think, important to think about what these things mean as we, as we include them. Um, so if we are going to use variants, so some of the ones that I think are, are valuable is you know, Mr. Big. This is the smoking variant. Um, I think it increases uh, smoke cigarettes by like one per day among smokers. It's enormous. Um, there's the FTO variant for BMI that explains you know, 0.3%. Um, Huntington's disease and eye color. There's, there's a, I think a lot of variants where we can see the SNPs, we kind of know what they do, and they have relatively large effect sizes. So that might be a good place to start. Um, yeah, and again, w w usually w the reason we might know about a variant is because it's very large and we've known about it for years and it's been um, carefully studied um, at, in labs, um, in, in petri dishes and, and things like that. So, um, 
So here's the, here's the next question. Well, you know, I, I told you, you know, here's all these data sets. You can apply for these data sets. <coughs> but should we collect our own data? You know, some of us may want to like run our, run our own experiment. Well, maybe, like I, I'm, I'm probably in fact, right? Now we can, if you gather the, the, the samples right now, the saliva samples or the blood samples, even if you can't afford to genotype them immediately, um, you can often store them for relatively cheap until you're ready to, um, to genotype it later. And so this is something to think if you're involved in, in um, designing a study yourself. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, we, we have a lot of things that we could do with the existing stuff, but, but if, uh, once we have polygenic scores, there's a lot of things we can even do in relatively small sample size. So here's like a quick table. If we have a polygenic score that has just 2% R-squared, um, you know, we're already at 80% power once we're at 400 individuals. So this is, you know, a, a, a relatively weak polygenic score. I mean, I guess there, there's a handful of ones that are at 1%. Um, if we're up to 11%, which is kind of where we are for educational attainment, we're above 80% power once we even have an N of 75. Um, so, so, so given these numbers, you know, I, 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 I think it makes a lot of sense that if you're gathering your own data, um, you should prepare to genotype it. I think that, and we don't even know, as, as we get more data and there's more GWAS and we increase the power of these scores, uh, you don't need to gather more data. You can update your scores and then be more powered then. So, um, uh, we talked about a few different types of genotyping. So if you're making your design decisions for here, um, you might say, well, what, what, which one of these things should I, which one of these technologies should I use? So before, you know, I, I think originally there was a lot of, because it was expensive to gather this data, um, candidate gene studies were largely used. Um, I, I think that probably these days um, it doesn't make a lot of sense because you can do a candidate gene chip um, and, it, and it doesn't really cost any less than just doing a full GWAS chip. And so I, I'm, I don't think this is probably the right, right approach if you're designing your own study. Um, you have the SNP chips, they're like $40 a person now, um, and, this, and, and it's going down, it'll get cheaper and cheaper over time. Um, you know, these SNP chips capture most of the common variation um, in, in Europeans, although I think chips are being designed to try to be better at that. Um, and, and you could even impute after that, so it's, it catches the you know, one million SNPs and then we can impute up to 10 um, fairly accurately. Um, and then once we have this, it allows us to calculate PCs, where if we just had candidate genes, we wouldn't be able to calculate the PCs to control for stratification. We can make polygenic scores once we have this. Um, the a disadvantage of these SNP chips is it doesn't really capture rare variants very well. And in fact, we can't impute down to rare variants very well. And so if the questions that you're interested in um, or that you think you might be interested in in the future um, are, are about rare, rare variants, um, maybe this isn't the, isn't the right choice. Um, so the next option might be to do something like low, low density sequencing. And so for these ones, it does just a f um, kind of a full genome um, scan, trying to measure roughly every, every variant. Um, it measures many more SNPs um, rather than just the handful that are, that are on, the, uh, on the SNP chip. Um, but it doesn't necessarily tag all of the SNPs uh, very well, right? Because I think in the standard sequencing, it tries to get multiple reads on, on each of them. Whereas for the low density sequencing, it sometimes misses entire segments and entirely. But, but hopefully as you gather more and more data, um, as you gather more and more data, you can impute better and better. And so, um, so even in the low, low density sequencing, those, those I think are getting to the point pretty well that you have about as accurate, as accurate coverage for the, for the same sets of SNPs that are on on the genotyping chips. Currently still not as good, but I think it's, it's getting there. And it, and it cross, costs roughly the same amount for something like this. Um, if you have lots of money and you need really accurate, um, you know, every single um, molecule in the genome, then you might consider sequencing for about $500 a person. It captures pretty much all genetic variation. Oh, and it'll capture nearly all genetic variation as well, with the exception of the of areas that are, that are difficult to, to sequence, I think. Uh, um, Andrea talked about. So that's, that's all I have. I think that uh, Dan's now going to talk about job market related stuff. All right. All right. Thanks. So since, um, since many, many of you are um, PhD students um, or postdocs, um, it might be useful to say something about um, what you can uh, expect on the job market if you continue to pursue social science genomics as a, a, a major area of your research. Now, the, 
Um, the job markets differ depending on discipline. So we're going to talk specifically about economics, um, psychology, and sociology. Um, my own expertise is in economics, so I'll speak to, um, to economics. Um, one nice uh, feature of the uh, uh, discipline of economics for this, this subject area is that you, you won't face any ideological opposition. No one's going to say, oh, you know, genetics, you shouldn't study that. You know, economists tend to be um, pretty um, open-minded in terms of the, the possibility that genes matter. In fact, mo m many economists find it very intuitive that, that genes uh, matter. But where economists will give you a hard time is that you, you know, they won't care uh, about the research unless unless they can be persuaded that it, it, is, it is economics, uh, by which they mean that it, it speaks to questions that economists have traditionally been studying. So the challenge on the economics job market is to, uh, to do research that um, other economists are going to see as you know, speaking to their traditional questions. Um, and so that may have a lot to do with the, the choice of research topics that you, you might want to pursue. Um, we know of um, a, a number of, you know, I think at this point, five uh, people who have gone on the, the job market viewed as genoeconomists, you know, with this as kind of their primary area of research, starting with, with David and, and Jonathan, um, most recently um, uh, Lauren uh, and, and Pietro uh, Baroli. Um, and, um, you know, they've all done well. Um, you know, you have to be careful. There's a selection bias. These are all, you know, um, uh, st strong researchers. They would, they, they, um, they almost surely would have done well, you know, had they gone into uh, other other areas of research. Um, but it is nonetheless encouraging. You know, people are getting people who are going on the market doing genoeconomics are are getting uh, getting jobs. Um, but it is um, a thin market, which is to say. Um, there aren't, typically in, in, in economics, the way hiring works is that a department is looking for people that fit in particular categories, like public economics or labor economics, maybe applied micro if, they're, if they categorize the, uh, um, the field uh, more broadly that way. Um, and so you need to, um, in order to get hired somewhere as a genoeconomist, the people who are at that school, say in applied micro, need to be willing to consider genoeconomics to be within their field of applied micro, and that's going to be the minority uh, of schools. So it's a, it's a, you know, relatively small number of schools that are potentially going to be open to, um, to hiring um, genoeconomists. Um, so it is, um, you know, so it's somewhat riskier. Um, so uh, next. Uh, we'll talk about sociology. Now, I'm not a sociologist, so uh, I've asked Dalton uh, to, um, uh, to convey to you uh, his wisdom about the job market in sociology. Um, so let me read to you what, what he said. Um, he said, of all the social sciences, my sense is that both the interest in and resistance to genetic integration is the highest in sociology for ideological reasons. Sociologists are wary of inequality rationalizing consequences of genetic analysis. Indeed, sociology was founded against the backdrop of 19th century biological theories of society, such as Herbert Spencer's organicism. That said, I do not conclude that anyone doing G or G by E work in sociology is a dead duck on the job market. <laughs> I think that a number of sociologists, <laughs> yeah, that's encouraging, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I think that a number of sociologists and sociology departments are embracing this torrent of genotypic data as they become increasingly common in survey studies that we often analyze. The very inclusion of genetic data into WLS, Ad Health, and HRS, just to name a few, suggests that sociologists are not all hostile to this sort of analysis. <laughs> While the N is still small, my observations detect a paradox. The top departments are the most receptive to this sort of analysis because they are the most positivist and the least ideological. But the students from these departments, with a couple exceptions like UNC and Colorado, 
are less likely to do genetic work in their graduate work because they are risk averse to damaging their job market prospects. But those interested in the topic from lower ranked departments are more willing to roll the dice and take a chance. I have seen this pay off. I should also say that there are a number of postdocs at Princeton, where Dalton now is, Michigan and UNC, for instance, that specifically look for people doing biomarker work. That said, many people do the sociogenomics as side work and do a more straight sociology dissertation. But I always believe that you cannot be strategic about what you study. You need to study what you are passionate about because you will be the most innovative about what you are obsessed about. You will also work harder. So if this is what you are passionate about, go for it. Um, so I, I guess I, I would add that demography is, some, is, is um, often, uh, uh, so demographers are often um, more open, or, you know, less ideologically opposed. Than, than other sociologists, and some sociology departments uh, you know, have a more uh, demography bent. Um, so I asked James to say something about uh, psychology. Is James, where is James? <laughs> we'll edit it in. Yes, <laughs> well, we'll uh, um, yes, okay. Uh, sure, yeah. That would be great. Um, OK. So there are some common themes across, across the different disciplines um, in terms of thinking about the job market. Um, so social science genomics is, is a new field. Uh, you know, even within psychology, where behavior genetics is, is an old field, the, the use of, of um, genetic data uh, is new. And new fields. Um, have some risks. One is that the market uh, tends to be thinner. Um, and um, because of that, shocks um, to the market can make a big difference. Um, so, you know, if, uh, if there are, you know, if, if there's a lot of bad publicity for the field, say, that could be a negative shock that could mean that departments are less willing to hire uh, people in this area. Um, you know, or it's just a bad job market year. Um, and then, you know, the, the first place that a department's going to cut hiring is the, the luxury items like, you know, um, genetics work that, that, that they don't need for teaching. Um, but, um, but the sense, uh, you know, across, across economics, sociology, and, and psychology is that the, the placements have actually been pretty good. Um, so it does seem like there's a, there's a return to um, you know, that, that uh, people in the field recognize that this is uh, new, exciting, cutting edge work and they're, and they're um, uh, uh, willing to, you know, so it, it, it earns some return in the market. Um, our view, obviously biased, uh, uh, is that it's, it's totally obvious that social science genomics is going to continue to grow very quickly just because the data is becoming so much cheaper and the methods are expanding. Uh, rapidly and our knowledge base is expanding. And so, um, you know, it, given, given that, we think the um, demand is going to be increasing and, you know, you all are in a, a unique position to be leaders um, in this field getting in uh, at an early time. Um, so David mentioned that we have um, uh, a listserv that we're going to default you into. Um, you can get out if you, you know, let us know. Uh, but, um, but it'll contain job postings, notifications about conferences and workshops. If uh, for some reason you, you don't get these emails or if you, if you have a friend or someone else who want, you know who wants to be added to the email list, they can uh, send an email to Chelsea Watson at this email address and, uh, and we'll add you. Um, and let us know if you, if you have announcements like job postings that you want um, to be sent out to the, to the listserv. Um, okay, so um, so to to wrap up, I just want to um, say some thank yous. Um, so the first set of thank yous is to all of our many instructors. I won't mention them one by one, but um, they're on the slide. Um, you know, everyone here has um, donated their time very generously um, to make the summer institute possible. So you know, we're all extremely grateful. Um, to, to the instructors who are here. So thank you.
Um, we're also um, extremely grateful to um, my wife, Samantha, for uh, handling the logistics. So come, come up, Samantha. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, and just, you know, obviously, she's like done a huge amount of work, as, as you know. <laughs> okay. Um, we're we're grateful to the Best Western Plus Pepper Tree Inn for being a wonderful uh, uh, location. Um, to Maribel Estrada, who's my uh, administrative assistant at USC, who's going to be handling the reimbursements and has handled the administration uh, interfacing with the Russell Sage Foundation. The Russell Sage Foundation. Um, who provided the funding for this workshop um, and has been, you know, a supporter of, of, um, of this young uh, field and, and trying to um, promote best research practices and also um, responsible um, um, uh, communication about the work. Um, uh, and um, we are grateful to all of you for being such wonderful participants um, and, uh, you know, for being the future uh, of social science genomics. So thank you. <laughs> and then we also want to thank, um, you know, they were listed on the slide of the instructors, but we, we have a special thanks to our wonderful TAs, um, Hui and Rosie. All right. Um, so we will um, see you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs>